yes. pra, a Pramian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a pleasure. So we are staying in the same hotel here, mm -hmm. which is built out of, did you recognize? They're all like, containers. Yes, yeah, containers. It's all completely made out of containers. It's the first hotel that of its kind here. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's a real nice spot. I'm still here. And apparently the water that's uh, sourced here is from the mountains and it's all heated up with the solar system. Wow. Solar, um, solar, solar panels. Yeah. Wow. And the view is amazing. When I woke up, I could see this massive mountain. You've taken a picture for me just now. Yes. <laughs> it was really funny when we got here. It was uh, really late at night. Pitch dark. I could not see anything. And from my window, I said, oh, too bad we don't have a view. It looks like I'm looking at um, like a wall. And then in the morning, I was pleasantly surprised because when I opened the, the curtains, it was gorgeous, beautiful mountains, green everywhere. Mm -hmm. Makes me feel so, I don't know, I feel closer to God. I feel closer to creation, I guess. And it's nothing you have back home because you said you are living in Los Angeles in the States. I do live in Los Angeles. There are beautiful, beautiful places there too. You just have to make a drive a little mm. bit to find it. A drive, that's a word. When I was in LA, I remember I was most of the time in my car, making it from point A to point B. Yeah. It's amazing. There's a lot of traffic. It's large, it's widespread. What do you do there, Eve? I am an actress and singer. Uh, my main work is voiceover for cartoons and international movies translations um, I'm in the theater there I do musical theater I also sing and occasionally I do TV and film that's a whole variety yeah and just half an hour ago or so I asked you wow you are even synchronizing like cartoons or giving voice for little kids mm -hmm. do you feel like giving a little example to us here <laughs> <laughs> sure um, I love doing kids voices it comes uh, really naturally for me so like, you have a daughter yourself. She's I jumping do. around here. I do, and I'm constantly recording it in my head. If I <laughs> sometimes I'll hear, or I'll hear children crying, and I'll think, oh, I want to like practice this and <laughs> record it in my head for later in case I need it. I put That's it. That's a smart thing. I never thought about recording voices in your head. Do mm -hmm. you have an example of how something or someone sounds? Yeah, I never experienced that. I think of it like a locker, uh -huh. like a locker room, and I fill it up you know with little experiences that I've had and and then I take it from there I draw from there when I need it so do you sometimes even make recording of certain voices or special oh, child voices or whatever sound you're hearing I only do that if I'm actually going to work on a specific project that mm -hmm. needs me uh, mm -hmm. to have that voice or an audition mm -hmm. if I have something coming up say it's a seven-year-old boy and I've never done that voice I look up seven-year-old boy uh, Uh, cartoons or like interviews children just speaking and I get a sense of it and then I do it myself you know I so you can it. even speak like a seven-year-old boy <laughs> not just a girl uh, I'm not sure <laughs> some there's a there's an age range where all oh, the children kind of all sound alike and yeah I do a little mm -hmm. more rasp for the boys like a little more short like <laughs> um, I don't want to do that no I don't care <laughs> uh, like uh, more I don't know, boyish in my head. Mm -hmm. uh, but for girls, sometimes I'll go a little higher, like, my mommy said that I can't play with you right now. And I, <laughs> that's I, hilarious. I'm so sad. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. What's your husband saying about the talent? Uh, he's, uh, I don't know, he doesn't say much about it anymore. He's so used to it. I'll sing to my daughter. Mm -hmm. like, in what kind of voice do you sing to your daughter? Like, I'll speak to her in singing. Mm -hmm. I'll speak to her like, Ellie, do you want some breakfast? And she'll respond to me like, yes, mommy, yes, mommy, I want some breakfast. And it's like it's really disgusting. normal for us in our house. It's like a musical in our This. house. And my husband doesn't care. He's just there. Like, he knows if I'm cleaning, I'm singing all the Disney songs. And he, he doesn't say anything anymore. He's just so used to me in the background singing all the time. This is amazing. Yeah. I've never heard that too. To, it's also a way of educating children, but in a funny, uh, humorous way. And singing is like, it's very natural. It's just like, we, we so forget about it, mm -hmm. right? Are you a believer that everybody can sing? Or do you say, 
Well, I do believe everyone can sing and has the potential to sing, especially with training. Mm -hmm. But I definitely think that some people have more of a gift, more of a talent. For me, I didn't have training until I was in college, but I, it was mm -hmm. obvious gift I had. As a child, I would be able to imitate the voices I heard or sing just the same way I heard someone else do it. You know, and that's, no one taught me that. It, it, it was not natural. your parents who said, hey, look, this is nice, try to imitate. No, no, no. But my mom does sing, so she knows how to sing, and I think that's where I got my, if it's genetic, I got it from her. <laughs> um, and we always had a piano in our home, so there was music around, and I, we, which my mom would take me to the puppet theater. So I was always around art, um, and that definitely influenced my decision to mm -hmm. want to be an actor. And singer you know sometimes it's the best when it's combined in a musical i get to do both at the same time and uh, now it brings me to a thought while i was working here on terrace this morning or was it yesterday evening someone were playing the piano mm -hmm. was it your daughter and now is your daughter was she playing the piano as well she was not my daughter actually slept on the road so she was not playing i played for very short but maybe there was someone else who did as well But the piano here is out of tune. Somebody needs to tune it up. <laughs> you can hear it now as we speak about it. Yes. Someone is playing. Yeah. Um, but still, it's nice because it's inviting. It's an open piano in the middle oh, of the room yeah. where breakfast it. is served, which is nice. This environment was very, very pleasant. Definitely one of the highlights of my trip here. I'm going to remember and cherish it. And I feel very grateful to just be here. So being here, now we are getting back to Armenia where we are right now. How long do you stay? Uh, my whole trip is almost four weeks long wow. and I'm at the last week of it now. So I have one more week left. And where have you been to in Armenia? Oh, we went to Stepanavan, we went to Lori Bert there, we went to Sanahin uh, there, we saw Hachbet, and then we went to Echmiatzin, we went to um, Aragats, I think it's called, and we had lunch there, and then we went to this very mountainous area, and there was a fortress there called Ambert. It was mm -hmm. beautiful, breathtaking, so gorgeous. Like I felt like I was in the clouds and with the greenery, and I felt so close to nature, like I was like really in part of it, and it felt great. It's, that's another one of my highlights that I'm like taking mental pictures of as well as actual pictures but I'm just trying to like savor those moments you know um what a, and lots of places in Yerevan nice restaurants and yeah so Yerevan is the capital you you dropped other names some of them did sound familiar mm -hmm. of course you know how to pronounce and speak them out I yeah. do not I just pick, could picture some of the map yeah. that I have in mind so Armenia is not very, very big. It has something that even less than 3 million inhabitants. Mm -hmm. uh, you can even make the whole country, I would say, within less than a week. You have seen certain corners. It doesn't mean that you've Maybe, seen yeah. everything, yeah. but it's, it's, it's feasible, right? So you are yourself Armenia, but you were not born here, right? No, I, w I was born here. Oh. I was born in Armenia. And then when I was almost uh, seven. And this is why you had said before you have two passports. Yes, I was born here and then we moved as a family to Los Angeles and uh, so I grew up there. I didn't go to school in Armenia. I went to school in uh, Los Angeles. That's where I grew up and oh, 10 years had passed before I made my first trip back here. And ever since then I've been back a few, few more times. Uh, but this is the first time I'm here with my husband, my, my daughter. It's a family trip. <laughs> So, and how old were you when you left the country with your parents? I was almost seven, so I was six and a half. Um, so I, I started school there in like the second grade, I think, half of the second grade. Um, and I don't remember there being a language barrier that was too much. Um, I learned the language very quickly, being in an environment that has, you know, English television and and. Uh, everyone speaking in English in the classrooms so I didn't have any difficulty with that but my my mom and my relatives we moved to a predominantly Armenian community, uh, community so for them it was a little easier to transition as well because they got to speak with and relate to people who were Armenian 
but at the same time, my mom took lessons at night for English classes. Oh, wow. And the TV really was the main thing that helped her too. And now, mostly um, the, the iPhone, you know, having the dictionary available and uh, voice texting shows you how to spell everything. So it's been really... This helps me as well, because me as a traveler right now here in mm -hmm. Armenia, mm -hmm. I can see that with English it's sometimes just not possible because it used to be part of the Soviet Union here. So the American and the English influence was not as predominant as, for example, in Europe, like yeah. Germany. In Germany Russian we are used... Russian was the most dominant. Yeah, Russian right? The so most they dominant. ask me whether I speak Russian all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and all I know to say is Spasiba. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but still, when it comes to those smartphone helps, it really supports oh, here the communication. There's so many apps that can really help you not only learn the language, but just in that moment if you feel like you're in a pinch and you need to find that one word that you're trying to say correctly you can just look it up in the dictionary not everything is obviously correctly translated <laughs> but for the most part it is i even find myself using it back home in la when i'm trying to have a full-on conversation with my mom and there's just this one word i can't find i look it up and then i translate it and she's like oh yes 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 do you speak uh, in Armenian to your mother? Yes, mostly I speak in Armenian, but I wouldn't say my Armenian is very formal or because I didn't get an education, proper education. I don't know how to read or write. I'm now teaching myself so that I can teach my daughter. I feel like the older I get, the more connected I want to be to my roots and find that it's more important than I had given it uh, before. So now I've learned the alphabet. Uh, there's some letters I still struggle with, but it's been so nice being in Armenia and seeing signs everywhere written in Armenian. And even if there's a few letters I don't know, I kind of put it together and figure it out. It's, so that's been really nice too. So you as a family, now I see your daughter, she's playing over there. Uh, that's her, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, do you speak then Armenian or English within your family? With her, we decided to speak only in Armenian. Wow. Because we know that whether we teach her English or not, she's going to learn it. Um, she already knows English. And when she's speaking to her non-Armenian friends who speak only English, she speaks to them in English. Oh. It's not the best English, but um, I'm not worried for her. She's very confident and she gets what she wants across. So when she does speak to me in English, I make sure she does, says it correctly and she doesn't mix half Armenian, half English. So I tell her, either say everything in Armenian or say everything in English. And But in the home, we try to stick to Armenian. Her dominant language is Armenian, but she's learning English just easily without me having to actually teach her. The only thing I've taught her is the ABCs, the alphabet in English. There are many Armenians living abroad, like something around 10 million Armenians. So it's almost three times of the number that Armenians living in the country. When it comes to your life back home in the U.S., um, L.A. and the area, it seems to be like a part of the uh, of the world where Armenians are very concentrated, where they mm -hmm. gather together. Mm -hmm. So, do you? What would you view your cultural life there? Do you try to keep up with the Armenian culture even when living so far abroad? And again, you left the country at the age of seven. Right. So, to what extent did you take in the American culture? To mm -hmm. what extent do you need to take care of not losing your roots? Right. And how do you do it then with your daughter? Right. Well, you're right. Los Angeles is, has a huge Armenian population. It's actually the second largest Armenian population outside of Armenia. Um, and I'm, I feel fortunate to be part of that community. Uh, there are people who joke and say that, you know, oh, you live in Glendale? That's Armenia. And, <laughs> and while I laugh, I think, yes, I do, and it's great. Um, I love that I could be in a store and I hear Armenian behind me. I've definitely traveled to other states, which is not very, um, you know, the Armenian community is not very much there, <laughs> like Florida and um, New Orleans, I, I went there, and um, in Louisiana. And, and uh, I think to myself, would I want to live here where I'd have to search and find an Armenian, you know? And I answer no I, I wouldn't I really like having uh, my American friends especially for my um, uh, by American I mean like non-Armenian American friends for my theater community and still having my Armenian connection through my church or my family 
because my mom's side is very large. She has seven brothers and sisters. Wow. And they all have their kids there. So all the cousins were all connected. And so they all live in the States? Yes. Mm -hmm. My mom's side, everyone is there, but my dad's side is here. Um, and I, I, I really enjoy that. I would say when I first moved there until maybe out, even after high school, I wasn't as connected to my Armenian culture. I felt like I'm thinking in English and then saying things in Armenian. I felt kind of like between two worlds. Uh, some things culturally I connect more with Armenian side. Oh, this is the dog again. Are you scared? <laughs> I'm so scared. <laughs> and he's really huge. He looks like a cow. He, he is very, very huge, but he's, uh, it's a she actually. She, she's, she's, uh, she's kind though. She's not, she, she won't hurt you. She won't. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know that doesn't calm you, but what were you we saying? I mean, I, I was getting back to this because you said you enjoy living. I, I would say like even different bubbles, worlds, because mm -hmm. here is a different culture than was probably back in LA or within oh, your yeah. non -Amer uh, Amerian, um, Armenian, based friends yes. in the US. Yes. How do you view the, um, this would be interesting, I would really like uh, to know that. <laughs> <laughs> what's this here? Yeah. <laughs> How is, what's the biggest difference you can see when it comes to your father's side family mm -hmm. and your American friends over there that do not have any Armenian roots? Mm. I mean, each culture is having its own characteristic, right? Mm -hmm. I used to live abroad as well and of course, It sounds sometimes very simple yeah. because it's a cliche sometimes, but yeah. sometimes there is a key of truth within. This is your husband above, right? Yeah, with your with daughter. daughter. I can't believe they're on top What's of the What's she saying? Roof. She's yelling something. I don't know. I, can't, I couldn't tell what she was saying. There was also some kind of construction going on over there. Um, the difference I'd say between... I'm not going to get into specifically mm -hmm. my dad's family because I'm not that close. But I will say with the Armenian mm -hmm. culture here, there's a lot of um, expectations. Mm -hmm. And over there, I guess the biggest difference, the biggest, biggest difference is American life. American families are very focused on individuality. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you want to go to a specific school and you want to go to a completely different state and be far from your family, it's very much acceptable to do that and then visit family during the holidays. That was a culture shock for me when I first was there that, wait, mm -hmm. your brother lives in Colorado and your sister lives in Nevada and your mom lives in, I don't know, Detroit. You know, it's like everywhere across the nation. And it's, it, you have to take, you know, I don't know, three hour flights or whatever just to get to your family where it, the thought of being away from our family is like, wow, why would you do that? How could you do that? You know, but I think there's, It's good in one way. You should have the individual. You should go after what you want and achieve those things. Uh, but with the Armenian culture, it's very much connected with your family and the decisions are made sort of communally and keeping that in mind, you know, your folks or your, or your, um, yeah, whoever your family is, but keeping them in mind when you're making those big life decisions. So coming here, there's definitely way more community I would say, and connectedness, and expectation uh, to do things together, um, and not be so independent, you know, to, to depend on one another for even um, things that are not just mundane things, like mm -hmm. running errands or something. It's very normal to do it together. But over there, it's like, why would you call me to go and, I don't know, <laughs> go buy groceries, you know, um, like that. Mm -hmm. I've seen those models like this individual concept that we have also in Germany um, already less in Italy for example you stay much longer within your family <coughs> before yeah. you move out whereas yeah. in Germany it's common to rather leave home uh, yeah. in between I don't know around 18, 18 and 20 something like this and then when it comes to other parts of the world um, when I was so, in Africa it's such a very strong community very yeah. strong tribe commitment even mm -hmm. and when you go to certain parts of Asia of course yeah 
And I have the impression that when you have a very strong state, the state mm -hmm. is taking over certain tasks like kindergarten or mm -hmm. elderly care. You know, you give away what used to be part of a community, a smaller community. Mm -hmm. My question would be because you know both worlds. Mm -hmm. The one here in Amelia where you have this community-based um, way of living and then um, in the US, um, on the West Coast, the other side of the coin, there are always disadvantages and advantages. Oh, I absolutely agree. You just spoke about um, expectations. Yeah. And my experience from very far away, of course, is that those expectations in a small community can also be a burden. How do you how do you view that? And can you well, what? How do you view that? Those expectations. Mm -hmm. What would be your idea how to deal best with that? Where maybe you have less freedom, less expression mm -hmm. of yourself because you have those community expectations. Yeah. We just spoke about the the role of women here in mm -hmm. Armenia, and you said even if there is a law in place, it can be shameful for a woman maybe to ask for a divorce or to claim violence, no matter what, right. because you have the pressure from family behind. Mm -hmm. How can you see, what would be your ideal solution? Because the individual way of living, I think this is what I wanted to say, is also not just clean. Yeah, yeah you, you maybe you lose some grounding, you lose the structure, the connection, mm -hmm. the feedback from your family, yeah. which can be very, very useful and helpful of oh, your yeah, own development. I definitely think there needs to be a balance um, your kids should be independent. They should be able to grow up and be able to take care of themselves and not always depend on the family. Um, and then there's also, you shouldn't forget your community and mm. who you're connected with and be there for them, their needs emotionally, physically, whatever it is. Um, I would definitely say there's progression happening here in Armenia from what I've heard. I talk to people. Um, but there... There are villages, there are places where women are uh, being treated poorly, not only by their husbands, but their mother-in-laws, mm -hmm. their sister-in-laws, where they even become violent with them. Mm -hmm. And it's almost expected that the woman would be quiet about it and not say anything. But if someone does step forward and is brave enough to call the authorities and make a complaint, perfectly legal for um, the you know police to do something about it but culturally they may say like you call the police on your husband or mm -hmm. um, if I were him I might do the same or, mm -hmm. like insert their opinions in a personal situation where they shouldn't they should only do their job you know that's not your job your job isn't to make an opinion about what I personally just went through um, your job is to protect me or to come and take someone in if they're about to kill me. <laughs> I don't know. Um, there are definitely those situations and I hear it. It's ra m more rare now, not as, not as common. But I don't know what laws passed recently, but there are more laws coming out that are protecting children from their parents feeding them and women as well, you know, from their spouses, mm -hmm. which I'm happy to hear about. Um, but there, I think there has to be a lot of work done culturally, subconscious culturally, before that shame is lifted. You know, there's sh there's healthy shame and you know, <laughs> and then there's unhealthy shame. Good distinction. And, you know, healthy shame is the one where, as a child, your your parent might say, you know, honey, don't do that um, because we are not like that. It's not, you know, we're expected to be better than that or whatever you know like we are kind we don't hurt people but that's an example i'm giving but when i was in garni you know that temple the pagan temple there, i overheard a family and the dad shamed the son in a very very uncomfortable way he the son was probably 16 years old and he yelled at him so badly he said you're an idiot uh i can't believe you would do that i don't know what he did he yelled at him and he said, I'm sick and tired of you. Um, and I just felt so embarrassed for the son. Maybe he did something very bad, but I think it would have been better if the dad had taken him away from everyone mm -hmm. and told him, son, you know, I expect more from you. And it's okay if he was ashamed in that moment, but it would be the kind of healthy shame that would make him 
change, but the way he shamed him in front of everyone and embarrassed him might make him worse, whatever he did, might make him more scared to go to his dad if ever he needed something, um, or make him feel like he is an idiot. Like, oh, I'm such an idiot. I, this is all I can do. I'm only going to do bad things, you know? So there's definitely a lot of like those family dynamics where they're rough and um but at the same time like if you ask them to die for their child they, they will you know uh so it's kind of like a strange situation to be in i just noticed that those you are you love the most you hurt the most sometimes and if we can just move on culturally and do better like consciously decide that you know the way we're used to doesn't have to be the way we do things mm -hmm. just because my mother went through it you know my sister went through it doesn't mean i have to go through abuse cycles can be broken and they can be changed if people you know actually decide to do something about it but if they don't have that support from anyone it's hard if you're mm -hmm. alone you know speaking of cycles i would like to put the focus on another area It's the Republic of Artsakh. Mm -hmm. um, when I speak to people here, some of them say, oh, the war has never ended since 93. It's, mm -hmm. it's a region that used to be Armenian that mm -hmm. has now been taken over by um, Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. And last year in 2020, there was, as you know, another war killing almost 5,000 people. So I would have a following question for you. Um, a friend of mine, he He is living in Europe and he came here to support the cultural development in Armenia. Mm -hmm. And I could feel how much he is linked to the country. And I said, wow, were you born here? No. So what was your link with Armenia? And he said, oh, it's a very far link because his grandparents had to leave Turkey because of what happened in 1915, the genocide mm -hmm. of the Armenian. And he was growing up in this consciousness to be there for his country. Hmm. So he said he was marrying an Armenian, as you, because you're also married to an Armenian, mm -hmm. he said. And it was very important for his family to keep up the culture and the living and the feeling of what it is to be Armenian. Mm -hmm. So we've been knowing each other for years already. And Armenia was not in the topic of our conversations because we met abroad in Asia. But I could still feel that he was very proud of being mm -hmm. Armenian. And now as he's here in Armenia, as I am, we could dig in a bit more. And I've just asked him, so why are you so linked to your country, despite that yeah. your grandparents were not even living in Armenia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now you're coming here in your free time and he's building up a cultural center in, in Arza. Mm -hmm. And he's giving in his free time. Yeah, and he's not even holding an Armenian passport. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, for me as a German, is nationalism is not mm. easy for us to express because of our history you know mm -hmm. what happened mm -hmm. uh, on second world war and in second world war mm -hmm. how do you describe that how is it possible to have such a cultural strong link to your home country mm -hmm. what are the major key drivers um i definitely think that your upbringing has a lot to do with it mm -hmm. how you're raised because i know armenians that moved to America like me and then they don't even speak Armenian anymore but I know people in Iran uh, for hundreds of years I don't know them obviously for hundreds of but I heard that there are families that have been in Iran for hundreds of years and they still speak Armenian and never stepped foot outside of the country and they still keep their uh, Christian faith and I find that amazing because it, it really does come down to your family and what they I guess um, find important and really develop that in you um, my family never really stressed oh you have to be na uh, Armenian nationalistic or whatever but because it was so part of our culture and we did care about what was going on here always sent aid you know mm -hmm. if, if we could Like sponsor a child or help an orphanage um, donate uh, clothing or money we always did that and so we were always in some way connected with them and 
that really helped me feel connected to my Armenian roots. That doesn't take away from me feeling like an American a patriot. You know, I, I, I feel that I am this, I am an immigrant, Armenian, proud Armenian immigrant who, who is also very proud to be an American. And I think that's part of the American story, you know. Um, but I definitely think that it's also part of you too, you know. Um, if someone can drive into you that, you know, it's important, it's important. But if you don't feel that connection and you don't desire to have that connection, nothing is going to change that. Like your friend who is here. For me, it was important to marry an Armenian because I thought our families would understand each other better. Mm. It didn't mean that I was closed off to the idea of not of, of being with non-Armenian. I was open to the idea of it, but I thought, oh man, but it's going to be harder for our families to understand each other culturally, to accept one another. Uh, my mom was always very supportive. She never said like, oh, you have to marry an Armenian, but I just desired to. Um, it was like, I prefer it, but if it doesn't happen, that's okay too, you know? Um, but I'm, I'm grateful that I did. Our stories are similar. He moved here to America uh, with his family when he was five, and he grew up in Los Angeles too. We met in college. Oh. Yeah, so very similar story. Um, and we, we find ourselves uh, realizing our culture, like our how rooted the Armenian culture is within us. Sometimes I don't realize it until I'm with only non-Armenian friends. Let's say we're out to dinner or I have them out in my home for dinner. And there's certain things that happen and I think, wow, this could never happen with an Armenian. <laughs> you know, like if you're out and you're paying a bill, mm. and it's just a very simple thing to say, but um, again, the individual part comes in where, well, I only ordered a salad, so I'm going to, but the Armenian is like, I'll take it, I'll take it, no, I'll pay for it, no, I'll pay for it. And there's that sort of banter and fight that happens. Um, there's all these like little things that you don't realize until you're away from it, that, that you think, wow, I, it, my Armenian culture is very rooted in me and I didn't even realize it. Sometimes you don't even, it's so much part of you that you don't even realize it. So, I don't know, I hope I answered your question. Mm, Not you sure. <laughs> I would have another, almost last one, if it's okay mm -hmm. for you. Yeah. So you said something about breaking uh, patterns or circles cycles. and mm -hmm. cycles. Yeah. So when it comes to the genocide of 1915, it's a huge injustice that happened. Mm -hmm. And different to the genocide of the Jewish people, mm -hmm. the one of the Armenian people mm -hmm. was not taken as much into account mm -hmm. when it comes to apologies, in mm -hmm. particular from the Turkish. Mm -hmm. And I, when I speak to people here, I can see that they still have this feeling of there was this injustice and there is still oh, an absolutely. open chapter. Yeah. How would you, what would you be your best, it's a very difficult question, I couldn't answer it by myself, mm -hmm. what would be your best solution for that here mm -hmm. to bring also peace in that chapter of the Armenian history? Um, sorry, that makes me really emotional because I feel like, um, you're right. The Armenian people do feel, feel the injustice still to this day. It doesn't matter that it was a hundred years ago because that wound is still open and trauma and family, um, injustice, it gets passed down. You know, it's almost like there's this dark cloud over the Armenian people that is just lingering. It's just lingering and it's lingering. And I think with anyone that you have a relationship with, if they hurt you, if they don't take responsibility for their action or what they did, as much as you will forgive maybe and try to move on, it's not easy. It's very, very difficult. And for someone to completely deny it, like Turkey does, well, first of all, in the past it was, um, you know, that, I mean, they'll claim that it wasn't, it wasn't Turkey or it was a war or it was mutual. You know, there's all kinds of things that are being said. So there's a lot of denial and a lot of um, 
objection towards any claim that there was a genocide. And the Armenian genocide is mostly forgotten because it was the first one of its century. And because um, there, it, was, it was 1915, so not as much, um, not as much media around it. Even though there are d documents, there are n news articles even that um, was aware of what was going on. And a lot of other countries who aided Armenia afterwards, who helped the Armenian people, like Syria. Um, but having the war last year, especially, I think completely opened the wound back up if it was even trying to close and made things worse because um now now people are like there are families whose households have m more than one person like a dad and a son who are gone now uh and for what for what for trying to live in peace we're we are not the instigators you know we are not the ones who are trying to aggravate anything we're a small christian country and i don't mean to focus on the muslim thing but surrounded by muslim countries except for Russia and it it just it's just insane to think about it it's almost unbelievable what we just went through and are still going through we're still even us driving to Thotev we were contemplating if we should even go if it's even safe because there are um, Turkish soldiers who are who have invaded parts of Armenia proper Armenia I'm not talking about Artsakh so you don't even know if you're safe in your own country and i was thinking well i'll take my american passport and may, that might help me and it, it really won't a piece of paper is not going to help you if someone was going to take you hostage or you know i i just i'm not i haven't dealt with the, what happened last year yet personally i have not dealt with it yet it's really hard to go through i want to go visit the cemetery where the soldiers are buried to pay my respects um i know it will be hard for me but i think it's important i don't know what the answer is to your question about how do we move on how do we move on well, I, it'd be really nice to say just forgive and forget but you can't hmm. you can't do that if your land is still being um threatened by out outsiders who are going to take it over who have the intention of taking it over and what can you do about it i think first and foremost there is no moving on from it i think first and foremost you have to create some kind of protection and build build some kind of army to protect yourself because as much as i would like to have peace with my neighbors of course that would be wonderful but if that person is completely denying that the government is completely denying that anything like that ever happened um and not even just denying but continually doing things now how can you even fathom the idea of being friends with them they are your enemies and they state that they are your enemies they raise their children to be your enemies from from very early on who are our enemies and they say in kindergarten and the children say armenians are our enemies we don't do that here. We don't indoctrinate our children like that, you know, to hate the Turkish people or to hate Azerbaijan people. Um, but now I would say you have to be smarter. You have to have a better military system, have to have better relations with your with other countries who are your allies to protect yourself because they don't care if they had it their way, we'd be completely gone. And if you can't even protect yourself how can i how can i even think of moving on or or being okay with you mm. you know once there is recognition and i i don't even know if there if it's mm, what's the word i don't even know if it's reasonable to say that there has to be some kind of restitution or some kind of repaying i'm not even i'm not even saying we should demand that i'm i don't even know but but what I mean is, like, if un until there's an acknowledgement and an actual, like, stopping of being aggressive towards us, then I don't think there can be improvement, especially internally with people, you know? 
how can we expect to be okay as a culture if your lives are constantly being threatened still you know i know repeat history repeats itself and especially if it's not acknowledged it is likely to repeat itself so i think awareness needs to happen in other countries and people need to take um it seriously and realize that uh, this is a human issue uh, it's a, it's not just a oh you yeah armenians are dealing with this they've been dealing it with it for a hundred years no if all of us can come together and care about the issues that are going on then maybe we can hold people responsible if the aggressor <laughs> thinks i'm going to get away with it anyway no one's going to hold me responsible then they're going to be more likely to do it but if everyone is pointing their finger and saying what do you think you're doing and they cut their ties off and they don't give them funding for anything then they're being held responsible and then there might be improvement i'm definitely not the expert on this at all by any means but this is just my humble opinion thank you so much um because i know how much this is a very critical and challenging subject also to comment on thank you so much it's uh now not very easy in having come from that question to the final and mm -hmm. last one mm -hmm. i know you're a singer mm -hmm. and you're armenian uh -huh. do you have any little song in mind that you would like to share hmm. and you feel like sharing does it uh does it matter what language it's in well I guess I will say, before I sing, um, that I, I, I don't even know who's listen, who would be listening to this, but um, Armenia is, an, is a Christian nation, and if there are any Armenians listening, I would encourage you to really take your faith seriously, and um, not forget where you're coming from. Um, I think that with God on our side, you know, there's hope. Uh, so I would like to sing an English song. Um, I'll just sing a small portion of it. And it has to do with my faith. bottom of my heart for sharing your story your thoughts thank you for and giving me that opportunity thank you for giving me that opportunity <laughs> thank you so much yeah i hope it was good content i don't know <laughs>